Welcome everyone on our first educative seminar. I'm Dorothea Berki, an internal support scientist at Omixon. We are a molecular diagnostic company and our foremost motivation is to develop an assay and software product to genotype the most polymorphic gene cluster of the entire genome, which is the major histocompatibility complex, and in humans it is known as the human leukocyte antigen. So the overarching aim of this educative series is to give you a summary on these loci. Most likely, when you hear the word HLA, the first thing that comes to your mind is its clinical utility in transplantation, its strong association with autoimmune diseases, and you are absolutely right, but the story does not end here. These molecules have an even more diverse effect in the body. Quite surprisingly, evidence suggests that they are even involved in mate selection, and we will cover all these areas eventually, so if you are interested to know why it is not you on the picture next to Eileen Gosling, then you have to bear with me. The discovery of the major histocompatibility complex draws back to the 1940s and is connected to George Schnell, a mammalian geneticist who studied inbred mouse strains, which means that all members of an inbred strain are genetically identical. On this figure, the two different colors represent the two different inbred strains. Schnell's study stemmed from the observation that spontaneously arising tumor in one of these strains could be transplanted into the same strain where the tumor grew progressively, but not to a different mouse strain where the tumor did not survive. In fact, Schnell first became interested in a mysterious cancer-resistant gene. But his research group also studied the transplantation of skin between these animals, and those experiments had the very same outcome and indicated that the recognition of a skin graft as self or foreign was an inherited trait. So their focus from tumor-resistant genes switched to the understanding of the underlying immunology. And they went further. After mating these inbred animals, they studied hybrid mouse strains that inherited one set of alleles from each parent, hence represented with both colors here. And they found that skin graft from a parent was not rejected by the offspring, but graft from the offspring was rejected by either parent. They called the genetic marker competent to play a role in the appropriate experimental or surgical context histocompatibility, or age genes. Drawn from these experiments and, and numerous further, they concluded that there were many loci involved in the process. Hence the term major histocompatibility complex was born, that is called the H2 complex in mouse. Although the understanding of mammalian genetics was in its infancy at the time, they excluded simple Mendelian inheritance and had strong evidence that these genes were codominantly expressed. Then 12 years later or so, the same loci were discovered in humans as well, by Jean Dusset, who was an immunologist. And what you see on this picture was his first observation. He studied white blood cells, also called leukocytes, that contain the major cell types of the immune system. After mixing the serum of a polytransfused human with leukocytes from another person, he observed um, these big clumps shown in the photograph. So he noticed that blood serum from one person could react with the white blood cells of another person. And this observation showed that differences exist between human leukocytes. And the next step was the demonstration that these differences are genetically determined. And they call the human MHC, the human leukocyte antigen system, because they were first identified in these cell types. And I will go into more details later on when we discuss transplantation. So soon after the MHC and HLA, HLA molecules were characterized, and identified as major regulators of the immune system. So what are they? HLA molecules are cell surface glycoproteins, and their main role is to bind and show peptides to the immune cells and trigger an immune response if necessary. In broad terms, HLA proteins enable to distinguish between self and non-self. And regarding non-self, there is a highly specialized way for, for response. For example, a virus that has entered the circulation and is free in the blood, needs to be eliminated in a different way compared to the same virus that has already infected the host cells and is inside the cytoplasm. So the response even to the same microbe is different in different stages of its life. And this is exactly why the immune system developed different types of HLA molecules. 
So class 1 are expressed on all nucleated cells in the human body and they display cytoplasmic proteins, as opposed to HLA class 2 that are on the surface of certain immune cells, endothelial and epithelial cells, and their source of proteins to bind are from the extracellular environment. Both classes of molecules can induce immune response, but just to give you a quick, quick explanation here. So the immune system rests on two major pillars. The innate Im immunity, that is a general, non-specific defense mechanism, and the adaptive immune response, that is a specialized defense and recognizes a much wider variety of molecules. So T cells are major components of, of the adaptive immune system. And both classes of HLA molecules signal toward these lymphocytes. The difference being that the responsive T cell subsets are CD8 positive in the case of HLA class 1 molecules and CD4 positive in the case of HLA class 2 molecules. And I will explain the meaning of CD in the next slides. This figure compares the two different HLA classes. As mentioned, both types are membrane glycoproteins that contain a peptide binding cleft. This is where they show the antigens to T cells. They differ in their subunit compositions, but are very similar in their overall structures, as you can see from this schematic diagram. And let's start with HLA class 1 molecules. The three major ones are HLA A, B, and C, that all consist of an alpha chain, non-covalently associated with a beta chain. The amino terminal end of the alpha 1 and alpha 2 domains form the peptide binding group that can accommodate peptides of 8 to 11 amino acids in length. These alpha residues are highly diverse and polymorphic. They differ among the three major HLA class 1 molecules, but also differ among different individuals HLA molecules. And in fact, this extraordinary polymorphism is the feature that guarantees the broadest diversity of recognized antigens and reactivity against pathogens. The TCR, which stands for the T-cell receptor, recognizes the displayed peptide and binds to it. But the lymphocyte also needs additional signals for its activation. And this role is filled by the alpha-3 domain of the HLA, which is an invariant region and contains a recognition site for the T-cell co-receptor, CD8 positive, where CD stands for cluster of differentiation. So the simultaneous binding of the T-cell receptor and co-receptor to the HLA molecule can induce the immune response. There are um, additional mediators involved that I will cover later, but these are the major components. And please note that each HLA molecule can present only one peptide at a time, since they have only one binding group, but each molecule is capable of presenting many different ones though. Also, these molecules can display peptides derived from self-proteins or from foreign, such as microbial or viral. But under normal circumstances, T-cells specific for normal self-proteins won't induce an immune response, and this is um, called the immunological tolerance. So, now let's see how the cell produces these small fragments to bind on their sur cell surface on HLA molecules, from the much larger intact uh, microbial protein antigens. And this conversion is called antigen processing. So the peptide antigens derive, derive from cytoplasmic proteins, which may be normal self-protein or altered self-protein, such as those found in cancer cells, that needs to induce an immune response as well. Or viral proteins found in viral infected cells. They are degraded by proteases in proteasomes, and the small um, peptide fragments indicated with green circle, circles are transported to the endoplasmic reticulum, where newly synthesized HLA-1 molecules can bind them. These peptide HLA complexes are then transported to the cell surface and can be recognized by CD8-positive T cells that are also called cytotoxic T cells. However, in the absence of a protein to bind, the empty HLA molecule is instable and will never reach the cell surface. So, this was uh, the class 1 pathway. And now let's focus on the HLA class 2 molecules. The major ones are HLA-DR, DQ, and DP. 
that consists of two alpha and two beta domains. Here the amino terminal end of the alpha 1 and beta 1 domain um, form the binding groove. So these are the highly polymorphic residues that, that differ between individuals. With the exception of the R molecules where only the beta chain contains the polymorphisms that specify peptide binding. And in all um, HLA class 2, this binding cleft is large enough to accommodate from 10 to 30 amino acid long residues, so much longer compared to the class 1. And it is because certain bulky tyrosine residues that are in the binding groove of class 1 are not found in class 2 molecules, so the cleft is more open at one end. The invariable beta 2 domain serves as a binding site for the CD4 positive T cell co-receptor. So now let's see how antigen processing takes place in this pathway and what is the difference uh, compared to, to the class 1 pathway. Although class 2 molecules are also synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum, they are kept inactive with a class 2 invariant chain peptide that is indicated with that blue colored circle here and that occupies the binding cleft. So as opposed to the class 1 molecules, the small peptide antigens are not inserted to their peptide binding group here in the ER. Upon protein uptake from the extracellular environment, protein antigen, antigens are ingested into vesicles that will fuse with a lysosome, and the proteins are broken down by proteolytic enzymes, generating um, peptides with different sizes, as mentioned, up to 30 amino acids in length. The inactive HLA class 2 molecules are targeted to this lysosomal vesicle, and once fused with it, the invariant chain peptide needs to be removed, and it is done by HLADM, which is a molecule that is also transported to this vesicle, and its primary role is this HLA class 2 activation. In the absence of a peptide antigen to bind, the empty HLA class 2 is unstable and will be degraded by the proteases inside this vesicle. Otherwise, the peptide HLA complex is delivered to the cell surface and will be recognized by CD4 positive T cell subsets that are also called T helper cells. So this was the class 2 pathway. And now that we covered the basics, here is an awesome video for you to show how antigen processing and presentation actually take place in the cell. Plus, I would like to give you a flavor of the numerous extra mediators involved in the process that control the immune response. So what you see here is a macrophage, one of the immune cells that, expre that express the HLA class 2 molecules. And the video starts with this macrophage taking up a pathogen, represented by the small blue figure. And once inside its uh, cytoplasm, fusing it with a vesicle that contains proteases to degrade the antigens into smaller, smaller fragments so that HLA molecules can bind them later on. And what I quite like in this video is that you can actually see how these steps take, take place simultaneously. So, elsewhere in the macrophage, in the endoplasmic reticulum, HLA class 2 molecules are synthesized and transported into vesicles. As you can see, they are kept inactive with the invariant chain peptide represented by that yellow figure until the invariant peptide is removed by HLADM and the HLA molecule can bind the small antigen fragments. After that, a vesicle containing the antigen HLA complex migrates to the cell surface, where it can encounter a T cell. So the T cell will recognize the antigen with its T cell receptor and will also bind to it with its CD4 positive co-receptor. And as mentioned, to trigger T cell activation and immune response, there are additional mediators and co-stimulatory molecules involved. So first, ICOM-1 
that um, stands for intracellular adhesion molecule 1 on the macrophage will bind to a lymphocyte function associated antigen that is expressed on the T cell. After that, additional CD, so cluster of differentiation molecules, come to play on the surface of both cell types. And this is what you see now. Finally, the cells even release small signaling proteins called cytokines, such as interleukin-1 or interferon gamma. And this is how they, this is how they activate each other. So previously I only mentioned the activation of T-cell, because indeed it will further signal toward additional immune cells and is a major regulator in the immune process, but in fact the macrophage is also put into a more hostile state as well upon these signals to destroy any bacteria it has taken up. So this was the class 2 pathway in action. All right, uh, this was the first part of our HLA educative series where we discussed class 1 and class 2 molecules. In fact, there is a third class as well that I would like to cover next time when we focus on the immunological background to transplantation. And then we will discuss the genetics of HLA, quite an interesting topic and pretty much is the focus of what we do at Omicron, so make sure to watch it. Finally, we will go beyond transplantation. So thank you everyone for watching this presentation. Any questions are more than welcome. We will make sure to respond and feel free to give us a feedback on our social media platforms as well. See you next time.